a kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and to be uh, discussing whatever I've been thinking about for many years with all of you. So as you probably know, uh, this is the first talk which is more of a general talk, but then there are three more specialized talks which will explain more details of what I'm going to say here. So as we go through this, please just stop me and ask questions so that we are all on the same page. And even if I don't get to the end of my slides here, that's fine because we have other lectures to go over the details. So what I'll try to do is just start from absolute scratch and try to introduce you to this thing that Stephen Hawking became famous for. He found this thing called the black hole information paradox, which has basically governed our thinking of fundamental physics for four decades now. So let's just learn what the paradox is, why it is so important, and how we think it is now solved in string theory. So let's begin with understanding the information paradox. So it's a very, very robust problem, which can be understood in very simple ways. And it all goes back to the fact that gravity is an attractive force. So here I have a mass capital M. And here, let's say I put a test mass, little m, a small mass here at some distance r. Then this mass by itself has an intrinsic energy, as Einstein taught us, equal to mc square. Okay, so if I have an energy mc square, I can presumably create that particle. But if I put it near this heavy mass m, then there's also a potential energy. And if I just use the Newtonian example uh, expression uh, just to get started, I would put minus g, first mass, second mass upon the distance. And the minus sign here is what holds the fact that gravity is attractive. And that's what will tell you that you things fall rather than go to the ceiling. So if you find the, ask for the total energy of this mass m, when it is kept near the mass capital M, again in this heuristic uh, Newtonian approximation, I would write something like mc square for the intrinsic energy, but then the energy is lowered a bit because of the potential energy. And if you just look at this expression, you see something a little strange about it. As you start making r smaller, then uh, this term becomes more negative. And at some point, actually the whole thing turns negative. And so if r is less than gm by c square, then the total energy of this guy at that distance is actually negative. So now you can see that leads to a funny consequence. Here is my mass big M, here's the little m, and here I drew the critical circle which we had at radius gm by c square. Of course, I should do this properly using general relativity because once you have gravity and special relativity together, they lead to general relativity. But if you do it properly with using gr, it doesn't change much. You still get the same effect once you are closer than a distance to gm by c square. You just get an extra factor of two. Then in there, the gravitational potential energy is so much that it can outstrip the mc square and you can get a particle with net negative energy over there. So this particular radius is called the horizon radius for this mass m. And inside that, this funny thing happens that the net energy of a particle can actually be negative. So you can see why that is so funny because now it looks like you can create a particle there for free. If something has positive energy, it costs you some energy to make it. But if the energy there is negative, uh, then you can you know, borrow, you can just create the particle and get some energy from it. Let's actually look at the picture in general relativity in a little more detail because we just need to understand the GR picture. So suppose I draw time going upwards, and this is my picture of a star, which I just start burning, so now it can collapse under its own gravity. So here I've tried to draw what we call light cones, right? So that time goes up and light can travel only on the surface of this light cone, and every other particle must travel inside the light cone because it has to be time-like. So far away from this gravitating object, the light cones just point in this normal way, but the effect of gravity is encoded in the fact that as the star becomes more dense and as we come closer to this critical radius, the horizon, the light cones start tipping inwards. So at this point, it's more easy to go in than to go out. But if you want, you can still go out. Because you can see you can still crawl out. But you come to a critical radius where the light cone tilts so much that, of course, you can go in. But if you try to fly out, you actually just stay at the same radius. So that's called the horizon radius. You can't get out of that. And if you're further inside, the light cones are bent so much, they point purely inside. So you can go in fast, or you can go in slow. But there's no way you can even stay at the same radius. This is the radius, the angular part. This is the angular coordinate around it. 
and the radius is measured out from the center. So you see you can't even stay at the same radius, you are forced to go in. And this is what Chandrasekhar found way back uh, in the 1930s that if you have a star which has finished burning and once goes to a point where it reaches a critical point where the light cones just dip inwards, it can't stop collapsing further because nothing can travel outside the light cone. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light. So everything keeps getting pushed further and further inside and ends up at a central singularity. So it gives rise to a singularity around that this radius which we talked about is called the horizon and uh, that's the cartoon picture of a black hole. But if you want to see in detail what's going on, this is what is actually happening in a black hole. So it's the light cone structures uh, pointing in, which is the crucial property because with the light cone going this way, everything is going to be forced to go in, in, in till it reaches one point. Nothing can actually stay here. So this entire region becomes the vacuum. This becomes the vacuum. This is already, uh, well, we assumed everything fell inside. So everything is empty and all the mass has gone to the center. So the reason this is so important for the discussion we were having just on the previous slide is that to do this particular funny story of getting the potential energy to be more negative than the mc square, I need to make r fairly small. And so small means it has to be less than gm by c square, which means the object itself must have a size less than gm by c square. So it wouldn't happen for the earth because for the earth by the time you get to the radius gm by c square, you're already inside the earth. So all the mass is not in there. So first you have to concentrate all the mass in one place and then this argument is so clean. You are going to get negative energy states uh, coming out here. But how do you get everything to crush to a point? But we just saw that. That's where black holes come in. They automatically crush everything to a point. So now you have a heavy mass at one point and now you can, any place you come here, you will get negative energy particles. Okay, the real problem starts now, or if you like, the real fun starts now. What we had so far was the classical picture of the black hole that Chandrasekhar found. Once something becomes dense, it just keeps collapsing and it just goes to a point. But now suppose you add quantum mechanics to the story, then we know that even in empty space like, let's say, this room, without any gravity being thought about for the moment, you have vacuum fluctuations. So you could get a particle-antiparticle pair. Suppose this is an electron, this is a positron, and they can pop out of the vacuum and then they can re-annihilate. So those fluctuations are going on at all times. The energy of the fluctuation, let's call it delta E. So it would be two times mc square, where m is the mass of the electron or the positron. And as long as the fluctuation lasts for a time delta t, such that delta E delta t is less than order h bar, well, then these fluctuations will sort of happen all over the place. Now let's see if what happens if the same fluctuation happens near the horizon of a black hole. <coughs> We've already seen the energy of a particle inside here can be net negative. The energy of something outside here is net positive. So you can arrange things so the total energy of this can actually be zero. And if it is zero, <coughs> and then you put in this equation, you see these guys don't actually have to re-annihilate because now delta t is infinity. In another language, these two particles are on shell. It doesn't cost any energy to make them. So the virtual fluctuation can just stay there as a real on shell fluctuation. And these particles can just exist for, for all time. In fact, the outer member can now just drift off to infinity. That's what's called Hawking radiation. And the inner member just falls into the black hole. So you can see energy is beautifully conserved. This guy comes out at infinity like normal radiation. So it costs some energy. And if you ask where the energy come from, well, this guy had net negative energy. So the total mass of all this region, which was M here, a little bit of negative stuff now, has actually reduced. Because energy is balanced and particles are coming out. And this was the discovery of Hawking in 1974 that black holes will automatically emit radiation, but then this is the entire process. So you can see everything is very simple and very obvious and also for that reason very robust. And so here's the uh, whole the Hawking uh, thing written out explicitly. The outer particle drifted out, you got a particle of radiation because the energy of this guy was negative. The whole mass here decreases, so the horizon radius inside which you can get this negative energy magic to work is now smaller. Remember the radius was gm by c square, but because the energy went down, the mass of that object went down. So you can see I've drawn this circle a little bit smaller, but now the process can repeat another particle comes out. And this time maybe electrons inside, positrons outside, this time it could be other way around. I just do them randomly. But as this thing keeps shrinking, the black hole keeps shrinking and more and more of the energy keeps collecting outside. And so the mass here will go to zero and all the energy will show up in the radiation. That's what we call Hawking evaporation of the black hole. So in the end, there'll be nothing left. So you'll actually get uh, something zero. Or maybe when this thing gets down to Planck size, 
at that time of course we can't really say what is happening because classical gravity which we are using so far doesn't have to work maybe it stops down at the Planck length people call that a remnant a tiny little thing which is left but in any case most of the mass of the black hole is gone and the hole evaporates away that's Hawking's famous discovery of 1974 okay. let me just pause here to see if there are questions yes please so it is very slow it is so slow that nobody has ever seen anything Hawking evaporate but the time scale is given by a very simple calculation there's only one length scale in the problem and that is the radius of the black hole so the quanta which are emitted they're usually massless quanta so electrons and positrons for sake of convenience they're usually photons or gravitons but then you could ask what is their wavelength there's only one scale in the problem their wavelength is the radius of the black hole order light okay so you know the energy of each quantum you can ask how frequently are they emitted but there's only one scale in the problem so when you, whatever speed time light travel time from here to here radius divided by c in that much time one guy goes out then the next guy starts that guy goes out so you know after how much interval each guy goes out you know how much energy each guy carries if you take the total mass of the black hole and divide by this you will find how much time it takes to evaporate so the answer is so long that uh, a black hole of solar mass will evaporate in about 10 to the power 120 years while the age of the universe is 10 to the power 10 years if you start with a black hole whose mass was 10 to the 16 grams as opposed to 10 to the 32 31 which is solar mass it would evaporate today in the age of the universe okay so this is not a but people are looking for that in the sky they look for primordial black holes of 10 to the 16 which are going poof today they have a definite signal because as you get near the end you can see the evaporation gets faster and faster because the wavelength gets shorter so they are higher energy particles and they also come out faster so there's a definite signal called a chirp that at the end it will just zoom, zoom off to a very fast shedding of energy and then disappear so they actually look for that in the sky to see primordial black holes evaporating away I think they haven't found any there's another question back there somewhere yes please so sometimes people say it's happening outside the horizon but that's not actually a, a good characterization of what's going on what really happens is that if you do this properly in quantum field theory it's the quantum field theory modes that go across the horizon they go from here to here they straddle the horizon on both sides they are the ones that actually stretch when the black hole metric is changing with time so when we do the more detailed lectures we will be showing how you actually get Hawking production so it's the actual Fourier modes that go from here to here they actually get deformed in a way that if they were unpopulated, they were in the vacuum before, after some time they get populated with particles, one particle here and one particle here. So it's not created inside, they're created simultaneously on the two sides. Okay. Yes. Just one more question. So uh, since this pair creation is happening at the horizon, one of the pair, uh, one of the particles goes in and it goes out. So if you keep adding such uh, particles, won't be at some point there will be enough Fermi pressure developed so that this Okay. Yeah, so that's a very good question and the answer is that these pictures are bad. You will see better pictures in the actual formal lectures on it. Here it looks like after some time this place gets clogged up, right? It just, there's no place to put any more. So how will the next pair come out? What is interesting is that there's actually not a finite amount of space. It looks like there's this much space inside the hole. Actually there's an infinite amount of space inside the hole. And the reason for that is that when you look at the general relativity picture, inside the horizon space and time interchange rules so it turns out if you want to draw a space like slice mm -hmm. inside the horizon a space like slice can is actually has infinite length so normally a space like slice would be something like t equal to constant time constant is a space like slice and we try to give our initial data or how many particles at different positions on a space like slice inside the horizon r equal to 2m a space like slice is for example r equal to m take r equal to constant that is a space like slice for all t but that's an infinite line because any value of t uh, that value of r is a it's actually a space like slice you have infinite space in there so when you actually see where these particles inside are going in the proper general relativity picture there's infinite space for them so it's roughly speaking it's like a cosmology the one once one pair gets created space sort of expands to become empty again and that in that empty space another pair comes up the space stretches again and another pair comes up that's not clear from this picture because we are not doing the gr picture there's another hand up there yeah please okay
Ja. Both the particles sucked in. Uh, yes, you can say that, but the Yeah, so I think the energy, you can't actually talk of particles and their energy and where they are going at the same time. I mean, the virtual fluctuation is a little more abstract than this. Uh, if you create a pair of particles and they are, both want to go in, it doesn't mean the energy is negative because what happens is that, so that's a, a good point to talk about right now. Inside this region, energy can be negative because we saw that from the calculation. But inside the region, energy can also be positive. And the reason is we added mc square for intrinsic energy. We added minus gmm over r for pe, but we didn't add the ke. There's also a half mv square, right? And so what is very important is if I take a particle from outside and make it fall in, outside it has positive energy. As it falls in, it will get ke, right? So then its total energy will still remain positive. So because energy is conserved in the infall, that is still true. The magic of, so the point was how do you create something inside so that it has the intrinsic energy, it will always have mc square. It will have minus GMM over R, but it should have no KE. So you can't do this by throwing something from outside. It has to be somehow created right there. And that's why the quantum part is very important. Before Hawking brought in quantum into the story, even though negative energy is available there, if somebody says, build me a nice power source by extracting the negative energy by putting something there and you know, running your electricity here, you can't do that because if you throw something in, it will have net positive energy, it will get KE over there. So the quantum part is very important. Another hand up there. Yes, please. Uh, the particles are created out of nowhere. These are optional particles. So how come they get involved in, uh, the, uh, in this process? So they are not really offshell because of this. Offshell just means that that energy is not conserved in the process. So if you have the vacuum and you create something with positive energy, it's called offshell because you borrowed some energy. In quantum mechanics, you can always borrow some energy for some time as long as the product is not too large, less than h bar. But because this thing has negative energy, it is actually an onshell process. We call this an instability of the vacuum. Whatever wave function you had, it can flow to this new wave function, the wave function of the empty black hole, and the wave function of black hole plus one pair has the same energy. So it's like I had a wave function here, it can flow into this more spread wave function because there's the same energy. So this wave function will evolve to this wave function, it just keeps flowing. It's just doing that. One more hand, yes. At the what? The immediate quanta are large in, uh, okay, quanta are large in number when the horizon area is uh, when the, but when it becomes small, the process, I mean the, the process that is happening in the horizon are small. So in that sense we can say that the immediate uh, uh, radiation, okay, quanta are small in number, but if, uh, we say that the uh, mass is inversely proportional to temperature. So if mass is small, the temperature is very high. So in the, in the when the uh, horizon, the uh, black hole starts to sink, so actually some of those statements are not quite true and when we do the more detailed thing in later lectures you will see that. So just because the area is big, it doesn't mean that the rate of emission is higher. In fact, it's other way around because the wavelength of the quantum that comes out is equal to the radius and the rate at which they are coming out is also equal to the time interval between emissions is equal to the radius divided by the speed of light. So a bigger black hole actually emits less. And the reason for that is that the gravity at the surface of the black hole is actually weaker. A bigger black hole has a weaker gravity. If you take a black hole which is as big as the ones in the center of a galaxy 10 to the 8 solar masses, the gravity there is like the gravity on Earth right in this room. But if you go to a smaller black hole, it goes way up to Planck scale. So things are a little counterintuitive. The tidal forces are much weaker in a bigger black hole and all effects are smaller. Okay, maybe I'll just go on now and we can take more questions later at the end. But this was good. This is exactly what I would like to do. We should just keep stopping and chatting every once in a while. So just to summarize where we are, the black hole basically evaporates away and Hawking was very happy with this story in 1974. And the reason he was so happy is because something which happened a few years earlier with the work of Bekenstein. So in 1972, Bekenstein had come across the following problem. Suppose you take a black hole and you take a box containing some gas, I've called it uh, some matter, 
and that has some entropy. So S matter means the entropy of this gas. I throw it into the black hole, it goes to a center and it disappears. So because the gas disappears, would somebody be able to say that they have reduced the entropy of the universe? Okay. So of course you haven't really reduced the entropy of the universe because the gas is somewhere sitting in the center, it's just that you can't see it. But if you can't see it, you don't quite know how to count it. And what Bekistan realized was, of course, when you add the gas, you increase the mass of the black hole. The radius of the black hole was 2 gm by c square, so that gets bigger. So if you say that the black hole somehow has an entropy, which is given by its size, then maybe the entropy of the matter goes down, but the entropy of the black hole goes up, and the total entropy sort of doesn't decrease. So, so he was trying to get the second law of thermodynamics to work out, and he figured out if the entropy of the black hole is proportional to the area of the surface, then everything sort of fits together. Okay, so just a guess, if you throw some matter in, you lose entropy, but the black hole becomes bigger, and then with some arguments they figure out you should focus on the area of the black hole, and if you say the entropy of the black hole, called the Bekenstein entropy S. Bekenstein, is area upon this, these days we also know the coefficient, then if that's the entropy of the black hole, then whatever the entropy of the matter, that decreases, but the entropy of the black hole increases, and the total will always increase, so we have saved the second law of thermodynamics. Sorry, just one little question. Sorry. Yeah. No, he couldn't get it. He actually left it here. Right. His arguments brought him here. It's Hawking's work which actually fixed the four. So we'll see that in a second. Yeah, yeah he couldn't get the four. Yeah. So you just said that if you put something inside the <coughs> mass, it's actually negative. No, this you have thrown from outside. If you throw from outside, you'll get the kinetic energy, it'll have positive energy. Yeah, it's not created by. Uh, so <laughs> at, at that time, 92, he didn't even know about the quantum mechanical creation. This is all just classical physics. It's classical physics. So then if, if the black hole has an entropy as Bekenstein, then by usual stat mech, there are e to the s Bekenstein states, because entropy is log of number of states. And then if you just want to put in numbers, you can have fun with that and see that a solar mass black hole would have 10 to the power, 10 to the power 77 states. And if you want to know what that number is, it's actually much bigger than the state of normal matter with the same mass. So if you take the normal entropy of the sun, but if you, uh, that is something, whatever it is, but if you actually compute the entropy you get from Bekenstein's formula, it's actually vastly larger. So whatever the entropy of these black holes coming out of this mysterious thought experiment, it is counting something which is not to be understood in terms of you know, normal protons, electrons, whatever. It, it is something else. So it's an interesting source of things to keep our mind on as we try to unravel the ultimate mysteries of you know, what physics is made of. But anyway, the issue that time was, the first law of thermodynamics tells you that if you have an entropy, then you have the first law TdS equals dE. So now you have an entropy, energy is just mc squared, black hole has a mass, so you can actually see that black hole must have a non-zero temperature. But that actually leads to a conflict, because if you have a non-zero temperature, the detailed balance tells you that if any object can absorb, if it has a temperature, it must also emit. The two rates are connected by just the Boltzmann factor depending on T, so at that time, it was of course known that if you throw something into a black hole, it will go in. So obviously, black holes can absorb. But at that time, it seemed that nothing can come out of the black hole. And that we have seen on our own earlier slide. If you look at the picture of the light cone, nothing can actually come out of this. So people thought nothing can come out of a black hole. And that obviously looks like a problem, because then the black hole can't radiate. And so detailed balance works down. So thermodynamics is breaking down once again. But now Hawking's discovery sort of nicely fitted into this just a couple of years later because now black holes are also radiating, not classically but by a quantum process and he even figured out the temperature because he computed radiation process. Once he got the temperature, he put in the temperature here and the energy is just m, mc square. Hawking gave a value for the temperature, it was 1 over 8 pi g m. Okay, we don't need it right now but we use it in later lectures. And from there you can compute the entropy by this relation and then you get this actual factor, put in the c and the h bar now you know the exact entropy of the black hole. So it's very funny, without ever knowing what the black hole is made of, or without ever knowing what kind of quantum gravity is going on inside the black hole, we already have some idea of what the total number of states must be. If this is the entropy, e to the dat must be the number of states. And so whatever final theory of quantum gravity we are aiming for, it must somehow produce that number of states. And if some theory doesn't give us that number of states, it's probably the wrong theory, because it doesn't agree with thermodynamics. So this is already giving us some good indications of where we should reach. But just right the next year, 1975, even though all this was looking very beautiful, Hawking noticed there was a serious problem with the radiation process that he had found. And this process is what is going to be called the black hole information paradox. There's the question.
what is the meaning of states? How to define the states? So states will be defined in the usual way. For the black hole, we don't know how to understand at, at the moment. Absolutely, we don't. But state will be like a normal quantum state in quantum mechanics. If you believe that ultimately all quantum theory underlies everything, then in quantum mechanics there are always states, so there will have to be some state. But in fact, the exact problem is, as you say, right now we have no way of understanding what the state is, because state means we should see some wave function or some structure. But right now we are seeing nothing. It's, we are seeing everything is one singularity. And so there's nothing to see. So that is one of the puzzles. But what is interesting is that we got the number of states without knowing anything. And we got it exactly by a very indirect argument. We got this pair creation. You compute this in properly in detail. From the rate of pair creation, you get the temperature. Once you have the temperature, you put it in this relation, and you get the entropy. So there is such an easy way of just from seeing the radiation process, you can actually guess the entropy. And it's quite amazing that you have the entropy, but you have no clue what the states look like. And so finding the states is going to be one of our issues. Counting them is going to be a first issue, but finding them is going to be the second issue. Okay. But right now we are still finding that, that there's going to be a more serious problem. So there's another step in the story. And so what is this problem? So Hawking radiation was created by vacuum fluctuations. So we said these are the vacuum fluctuations, same picture. Let's call the outside guy B and the inside guy C. We just gave them names as two particles. But vacuum fluctuations typically produce what are called entangled states. For example, the positron could be on the right, electron could be on the left. But it could also be other way around. And normally you just get a superposition. Or if you just thought of the spins of these particles, even if they were not charged particles, they had spins, you could have the up spin on the right and the down spin left. Or you could have down spin here and up spin left. And you typically produce a state of your superposition of the two. And typically, you would create a singlet because it came out of the vacuum. So the two would be entangled in a singlet. So if you look at the spin or you look at the charge, you'll typically produce things which are entangled. So what happens if you do this near a black hole, you'll produce it in this order with electron inside, positron outside. But there'll be an equal amplitude to have positron inside and electron outside. So if you just focus on the part which is outside, it is entangled with the part which is inside. So just to remind people who may not be that familiar with entanglement, is something which happens all the time in quantum mechanics. If you take two electrons and you put them in a singlet state, then it's up, down, minus, down, up. And so if you take any one electron, you ask, what is this guy's state? That doesn't have any answer. It is up if the other guy is down. It is down if the other guy is up. By itself, it doesn't have a state. But the overall state makes sense. OK, so nothing very deep about it. We all know that. But here, we are just observing the fact that when the black hole radiates by pair production, the outside particles which come out are entangled with the particles left inside. We schematically write that as the wave function of the pair is we can just give any two states. This could be 0 and 1 could be up and down, or they could be electron and positron. Any way you write, but schematically, entanglement means that the state of the two systems, system B and system C, is not just something of B times something of C. That's called a product state. But if it's something of B and something of C, plus something else of B and something else of C, that's called an entangled state. Like up down is not entangled, but up down minus down up, well, that is entangled. Okay. So this is just a, so you can just schematically write it like this. They could have other coefficients or whatever, but the only thing is they need to be entangled. So let's just take this simple form and continue with that. So what's the problem with that? Of course, here I just wrote the general form of an entangled state is something, if it has two systems A and B, it is some state of system A and some state of system B. If you just have a direct product, it's just an unentangled thing. But if you have some of many such guys, then it's heavily entangled. And the more number of terms in the sum, the more entangled it is. A measure of entanglement is called S entanglement. It's called the entanglement entropy. And when we do the proper lectures about this, we will see what that is. So, but anyway, what happens is after you radiate n particles, the entanglement entropy in that simple model we took, it becomes n times log 2. Each of this 0, 0, plus 1, 1 state I wrote before, the entanglement between the b and the c in this state is actually log 2, because there are two terms, roughly the log of number of terms. So the entanglement entropy becomes n log 2. So you can see the entanglement is growing. So if you take time and you take the entanglement entropy, you plot a graph, you can see it's monotonically increasing with each extra emission, because each particle is entangled with its partner. Okay, so as the eruption proceeds, you're getting more and more entanglement. And so now Hawking found a problem. What happens when the black hole goes poof? Now the black hole has disappeared. So you're left with all the radiation. The energy has nicely balanced out because whatever energy was in the black hole is now in the radiation. We already saw that. But what do we do with all these guys? Do these guys have any quantum state at all? And why don't they have a state? If I give you a pair of electrons which were entangled with each other, up, down, minus, down, up, it doesn't matter if I separate them very much. I could put one on Earth and one on Mars. That's OK. We just have an entangled pair. But if the one on Mars disappeared and didn't exist anymore, 
then I don't know what is the state of the remaining guy because it's not up and it's not down. It was up if the other guy was down and down if the other guy was up. If the other guy is not there, I don't know what to say for this guy. So we can be a little bit more precise about this because this is the exact guts of the problem. So here I made a toy model for you. If you have two particles in a singlet state, first particle, second particle, up, down, minus, down, up is the singlet. So everybody familiar with this? Standard quantum mechanics. Suppose you say, okay, the first particle disappears from the universe. What is the state of the second particle? The first your gut reaction might be, I'll just leave this in here. So I'll do this minus this. I'll just delete this thing. And so I'll get this. Okay, so you just have one particle. Spin down, minus spin up. If you ask what is that state, it's actually state along the minus x direction. You guys remember your quantum mechanics, you know what state it is. A spin up, minus spin down is spin along minus x. Okay, but I could write exactly the same state by choosing a different basis. So if I choose base for the up state here the same way, here I could choose this as my natural basis. I could multiply this by e to the minus i theta and this by e to the i theta. You can see the overall state is the same. Okay. Now if you delete the first particle from the universe, you are left with this and you are left with this. But now you can see if you can choose different values of theta, suppose I take theta equals pi, I get this plus this and then I spin along the plus x direction. So that's why there is just no way to have two entangled particles. There's no way to delete one particle from the universe and assign a state to the remaining particle. The only thing you can say is that the mod square in spin up and the mod square in spin down, like here it is equal mod square here and here, the mod squares are equal here and here, they will be the same. It's like saying you can preserve the density matrix, which are the probabilities, but not the actual state. The state doesn't make sense. And here's a simple example. If you have two entangled particles and one disappears from the universe, the state of the other particle doesn't exist. Okay. So this, is, this was Hawking's problem. And so this is the black hole information paradox in a nutshell summarized in one, one slide. This is Hawking over there. You start with a star. And that has some well-defined wave function. Star just has many, many atoms in it. So you could write some complicated wave function psi i for that. Just let me finish and I'll take your question. Then it will then all collapse and make a black hole. We saw that with the light cones pointing in. Then you will get this pair creation. You get these entangled states. And then in the end, this guy goes poof. You are left with these guys. But they can't be described by any quantum state at all. And this contradicts quantum uh, mechanics because there we have, in normal quantum theory, we have unitary evolution. The final wave function psi f is always obtained as some e to the minus i h t on some initial wave function. So there was well-defined initial wave function, but the final guy can't be described by any wave function. So that means it doesn't matter that we don't quite know the Hamiltonian of quantum gravity. Everybody agrees we don't really know quantum gravity. But we haven't used any quantum gravity in this logic. All this Hawking pair production all happened near the horizon where the gravity is very weak. As we said at the, for a uh, galactic mass, black hole like 10 to the 8 solar masses, the gravity is as strong as the one in this room. So there's nothing particularly quantum gravity about it. And you keep doing this process and you find that you just lose quantum mechanics. So Hawking's conclusion was that black holes and quantum mechanics are not compatible. And more generally in a theory of gravity, we should give up unitarity. We should describe things by density matrices, but not by wave functions. So that's a very serious conclusion because quantum mechanics works everywhere else, but its logic looks so simple and so robust that nobody could find a hole in it for several decades. There was a question which I can take now. So instead of being a black hole, it can be the remnant that mentions in slides Yes. So it is certainly possible that you could end in a remnant. So people are so unhappy with this conclusion that you would lose quantum mechanics, they immediately rush to say, OK, but maybe when it gets to Planck size, you'll be left with a tiny remnant. The problem with that is the tiny remnant has to have a mass of about Planck mass and radius of about Planck radius, very small. But inside, it must have an infinite number of objects hiding in it. And why is that? If we just go back to the pictures of what we had in the evaporation, then all these partners of these, the entangled partners, were all sitting inside. Now, you could start with a mass, which was one solar mass or 10 solar masses, or as big as you want. You'll get more and more of these guys. And all those guys must finally come down to Planck mass. So the infinite number of Planck mass objects in the universe possible, each of which has like an arbitrary amount of stuff inside. And it looks very funny to have a quantum theory where you have an arbitrary amount of states with a bounded energy and a bounded volume. Normally, that doesn't happen in quantum theory. If you have you know, bounded energy, but infinite volume, you can still have infinite number of cells of phase space. But if you bound both the momentum, like D3P and the D3X, then you, know, you have only one cell of phase space of volume h bar cube, D3P, D3X. So in a bounded energy and bounded volume, how do you fit infinitely many states? The models for remnants became very funny. 
That's not to say you can't make them. So people in the GR community, a lot of them still believe that things end in remnants. It's not, however, compatible with what we know in string theory. So I won't talk more about remnants, but remnants have very deep problems of their own. And we can talk about them separately when we do this stuff in detail. But uh, certainly they are not compatible with string theory, so we don't really study them these days. Is there a hand up somewhere back there? Okay. Can I ask the yeah. Energy of what? Energy of, uh, energy of the particle. You said that there's a problem with having uh, an infinite number of objects uh, with bounded energy yes. bounded in a bounded region. Yes. So, but if the energy of the, each of these objects goes like 1 over n square or 1 over n. No, absolutely that would work. Yes. It's just that if you want to have something of energy very light, like 1 over n square, yes. in normal physics that comes if I give you a big volume and then the wavelength is very long. So, what I'm saying is if you give me a small wavelength, if you can find the size of the box, the D3, D3P argument is very rough because we're not using any gravity there. But certainly if I give you a limited D3, X and P in normal flat space field theory, that's where the bound is. The reason that gravity can still get away with it and make models of remnants is because the PE is negative and unbounded below. Minus GMM over R is unbounded below. And that's where all these problems are coming from really. So if you, if you ask like, how come in this little object, how come the total mass of this is going to zero? All the mass is already here. How is the mass of this zero? All the initial mass is here. All this other stuff is also sitting here. How is the mass of this going to zero? It's going to zero because this has mc square positive. It really, these guys have little mc square positive. But there's a minus gm over r which is doing it. So because you have the potential unbounded below, all the magic is there. But uh, So you can make models of remnants, but they're not compatible with ADS-CFT, for example. So we, we don't normally deal with that. We need something, yeah. You said, you said we need, right? Absolutely. We need. If you need, your entirety is to be preserved, if somebody is entangled with somebody, that somebody has to exist in some form somewhere. But now we have no energy to hold that. So it can't be because the question is where do you have the energy? So you need energy to create a particle, right? So if you want to be entangled with, let's say, a graviton, okay, so now you have a large number of particles here. The number of particles is m over m Planck whole square. So suppose there are 10 to the 128 particles for solar mass black hole. Now I need 10 to the 128 gravitons. Okay. Now, they are all inside here. Right? They are not in the radiation. So, their wavelength is Planck length. Each of them costs energy M Planck. But my total energy is M Planck. I need 10 to the 128 of them. There is no mass. So, the point is, yeah, to be able to entangle something, I need particles or some structure there. That structure needs energy, but I have no energy. If you go to the vacuum, I have zero. But even if you bound my energy, I can't somehow create an unbounded number of states to entangle with. And the unboundedness is coming because the start could start with a black hole of bigger and bigger size and then come down to this guy. So, and again, I said it's not that you can't do it because you can use the negative energy of gravity, but it doesn't fit with many other things. Like in string theory, if you go and ask what are all the states of Planck mass, we can start from scratch and compute them. You take the string, there's a string, the second state of the string, third state of the string, a few d brains, and that's it. There's nothing else at Planck mass. So, we sort of know it's not there. Yeah. Large, definitely. Yes. But large won't help me. I need small because large would be more energetic. The problem is my total energy is bounded to one Planck mass. By the time the black hole has gone to one Planck radius, its energy has also gone to one Planck mass. If I just put that in the formula gm by c square. If my total energy is bounded by one Planck mass and my wavelength is also bounded by one Planck mass, I indeed have lots of modes available of you know one tenth Planck length, hundredth Planck length. They are very high energy modes. The energies are 10 Planck mass, 100 Planck. I can't excite even one of them. My total energy is at Planck mass. It's not only the size, but also the mass which is gone. All the energy is gone. So the point is there's nothing to entangle it because there's no energy budget to have that stuff. Yeah. Um, so sometime back to, in response to a question, you said that inside black hole there is basically infinite length. So if yes. it becomes a system of size like that, where does this infinity come from? So inside the black hole, when you, in the model, when you properly go there and you see the infinite length, I will show you that in maybe later lectures. You can fit things in, and those are the models of remnants that people use. So, you know, but if we have a box of size length, where does yeah. infinity come? Okay, the infinity comes because the length, what we are talking, is too rough right now. Okay, so if I really talk of a normal, if this was normal flat space physics, 
that was more like the answer I was giving to this question. You know, if it's a flat space physics, this is the length, and then the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. Once you go start using the metric of the black hole and time and space interchange rules, a whole new set of things is possible. And that's why remnants are possible. I'm just not talking about them now because those GR pictures are not on the screen. But then there are other problems with having them, with remnants, which I haven't gone into. Okay. But we will go into, they are conflicting with string theory and so on. But GR people still think they can get away with it. So we will discuss remnants at some point. But I'm actually not really answering the question because I haven't gone into remnants. Okay. So let me go on anyway, and uh, we, we can catch up with more questions at the end. So now we are seeing the problem. And so here is our complete information paradox on this slide. And so this is the black hole information paradox. Okay, so let's see what string theory has to say about it. So let's talk about what black holes we can say about this in string theory. So far it looks like string theory can't have anything to say about it because string theory is the theory of quantum gravity, so it only changes things at the Planck scale. But none of these arguments had anything to do with Planck scale physics. So that's very important because everybody knew all along that we don't understand physics at the Planck scale. All kind of mess can be going on. So if any of these arguments depended on Planck scale physics, nobody would have believed Hawking, there would have been no paradox. But you can see none of the arguments have anything to do with Planck scale physics. It's just completely robust. You can just go through them again and see the Planck scale physics never comes in. So at first you would say, how can string theory change anything? Whatever you do with the Planck scale, it's just some new nonsense you're getting from at the Planck scale. It should have nothing to do with it. But let's see anyway, let's proceed and see what we can get out of it and uh, see where it, where it takes us. So in string theory, you have a known set of fundamental objects. You obviously have gravitons. Every theory of gravity has gravitons. But other, instead of point particles, you typically have what are called extended objects, like they are strings. So they are like rubber bands. The energy of a string is just proportional to its length. So there is a string. You can also have higher dimensional sheets. If you have a five dimensional sheet, you call it a five brain and so on. Okay. It's very important we are go, have, going to have these extended objects and so on. In fact, all the features of string theory, which normally look just painful and idiotic, are actually going to be extremely useful in coming back and solving the black hole problem magically. So how are you going to make a black hole in string theory? A black hole means you want to break a lot of objects in the theory and make a bound state, which has a large amount of mass. And then hopefully the gravity of that creates a black hole. So to make a black hole, you must take a bound state of a large number of these objects. Now you know the string theory lives in 10 dimensions, 9 space and 1 time. So to get down to 3 plus 1, 6 of them must be compact circles. I guess everybody is familiar with the idea of compact dimensions. So let them just be circles. They can be more complicated shapes, but let's just them be circles. So I've drawn a circle here. This is the non-compact dimension one of our three space dimensions, and this is one of the compact dimensions. And then what you can do is, suppose you take a graviton and you send it racing down around the compact dimension, that from the point of view of the non-compact dimension, it just looks like there's some energy sitting at this location. Does that make sense to you? It's just dimensional reduction. You could also take a string and you could wrap it around the compact direction, and again from the point of view of the non-compact dimension, it looks like some energy is sitting there. These strings also carry a charge, because strings can be winding this way or that way. So then when you look at it this way, it looks like a positively charged, negatively charged object. The same is true here. The graviton could race around this way or race around the other way. So this thing has also got positive charge and negative charge. This is just standard dimensional reduction. And again, you can have five brains when you wrap them on five directions, not one circle. But as I said, there are six compact directions. You can wrap it somewhere. And then you're going to get some uh, object like this. But that's not what we really want. We want to make a bound state of these guys. So you could mix together some of these, some of these, some of these, make a bound state. You can see I have a little bit of everything in here. And that looks like some messy object which carries some kind of charge of this kind, some kind of charge of this kind, some kind of charge of this kind. You get some massive charged object over here, a localized object. So you can see basically this is all you can do to make a black hole. You have these objects, you make a bound state, that is the black hole. If you can study these bound states in string theory, you study whatever there is to study about black holes. So in some sense, this is the beginning and end of the problem. But let's see what it tells us. The trick here was that you actually have the coupling constant in string theory can be varied. It can be made to be small, it can be made to be big. Because it's a unified theory, once you reduce the coupling, the interaction between all the particles becomes small. But gravity is also comes from the same interaction. So gravity also becomes weak. So you can actually take the limit of where the coupling has basically gone to zero, or very weak. And then there's no gravity, nothing to worry about. It's just some strings and brains, there's no black hole, nothing. And you just have, and you can count that if you put these things together and you make a bound state, does that bound state have some degeneracy? For example, if you take the hydrogen atom, there's a hydrogen atom at some particular energy level, there are some degeneracies. There are many possible YLMs and so on. So you can find some degeneracy at a given level. So you can ask how many states you have of a given energy. If you take, let's say, N1 units of the first kind of charge, N2 units of the second kind of charge, and N3 units of the third kind of charge. This, maybe you can say, comes from the gravitons. 
this come from the strings you wrapped, maybe this came from the five brains you wrapped, and people actually computed the degeneracy of these bound states, and they found some number, so the entropy was this, so the number of states was exponential of this entropy. Okay, we haven't proved where it comes from, but we'll actually see that in the more detailed lectures. It's very easy to derive this. So you can actually see, that if you put together three kinds of objects, the entropy actually grows pretty rapidly. It goes as a product of the number of different kinds of objects you take together. It's very interesting, if you take a lot of the same kind of objects, lots of n1s, it doesn't give you much entropy. This is not the answer. The entropy is basically a finite number. It doesn't grow. But if you mix three, three different kinds together, it just grows like the product. It's just very interesting. Okay, so, but now the, you haven't got a black hole yet, but now you can imagine just now gradually increasing the coupling. If you increase the coupling, everything becomes stronger and gravity also becomes stronger. So then you might expect that around this you'll get a lot of gravitational attraction and then you will have all the usual gravity of a point mass and then you will get some horizon and the horizon will have some area A and so you can compute this microscopic entropy which is coming from the A by 4G. And magically what these people found, Strominger and Waffer, building upon earlier work of Ashok Sen, is that this count of states, which they got directly by doing this story, was exactly equal to this area over here. So in a way, we have finally managed to count the states of a black hole. In a way, also you haven't. Because this was done at weak coupling, and this is done at strong coupling. So when you change the coupling, the number of states can, in principle, change. But the trick here was that what they did was they looked at states which had supersymmetry, something we haven't really talked about. And when you have supersymmetry, then you can actually prove that the number of states at weak coupling and at any other coupling, including strong coupling, will actually not change. It's slightly more subtle, there's something called an index, but we won't go into that right now. The number of states won't change. And if so, if you look at least at supersymmetric black holes, a supersymmetric black holes are black holes which have as much mass as charge. It's somehow a natural thing to arise in string theory, because every fundamental object in string theory, like this one, this one, or this one, they are all objects which have a mass equal to charge. It's very interesting, all fundamental objects in string theory are supersymmetric, which means their mass is equal to charge. And what that means is if you keep two copies of the object here and here with you know, opposite charges, with the same charge, their gravity will attract, their uh, charge will repel, but they'll exactly balance. That's the meaning of mass equal to charge. So all fundamental objects have mass equal to charge, and so because if you just choose these, the total objects also have mass equal to charge. For those, as you change the coupling, it can be proved that the number of states don't change, and magically, the number of states which you can actually compute by just looking at ordinary flat space field theory, you can compute the bound state, it agrees with this area entropy, and you can do other things like see that if you excite this guy at what rate it radiates, you can compute some radiation rate from this microscopic theory at weak coupling. It agrees with the Hawking radiation rate that Hawking computed, at strong coupling. So quite magically, it seems that we are suddenly understanding from string theory, just playing with these strings and brains, we're able to reproduce all the numbers down to the last factor of 2 and pi that we were getting from these abstract thermodynamic arguments. So at first it would look like that we are understanding something, but there is still a problem. It just suggests that string theory has the right degrees of freedom. That's why the entropy is working out. We're counting the right degrees of freedom, but we haven't really solved our problem because first of all, when you actually go to strong coupling, we don't know what the states look like. There are no wave functions. In fact, Wheeler had a theory, a theorem called black holes have no hair. All black holes are identical. <clears throat> they only depend on their mass. If they have no hair, there's nothing to count, then there's no entropy you can possibly count. Of course, you can always say the entropy is hiding here, but then you can't see anything. So it's sort of a bit of a cop out. You can't see anything. So we don't actually understand the states. But the other and more serious problem is that once you have this picture with the horizon, you're again going to create the entangled pairs. Remember, we called one of them C, one of them B. And you're going to have the information paradox. So the real problem which we had with the information puzzle, we haven't gotten any solution to that. So uh, we really have to go and dig into the information puzzle, but it certainly tells us string theory is along the right path to be getting us something coming out of this. Okay. So again, going back to what we are looking for, normal bodies, they radiate from their surface. Like if you have a piece of coal, there's an atom here, the atom could be in an excited state, it emits a photon. Well, even the photon and the atom are normally in an entangled state because suppose the atom was a singlet, it emits a photon, the photon can be spin up and the atom will be left spin down. But there'll also be some amplitude for the photon to be here and this to be here, they'll be together, they make a singlet. So the photon is entangled with the atom. And that's why if you plot time versus entanglement for a piece of coal, in the beginning, the entanglement between the coal and the radiation is going up, just like in the black hole. But the coal completely disappears, so after some time, the atom is also going to drift out like a piece of ash. We want to mimic the black hole thing, right, when everything goes away. 
So then after this atom also drifts out of the coal, these two guys are entangled with each other, but not with what is left behind. So in the end, you're left with nothing in the coal when you burn coal, and all the radiation and the atom are entangled with each other. And so after some time, the radiation entanglement starts decreasing. Right at the end, when you come back to the vacuum here, there's no entanglement of this star side with this side. It's all with each other. It's not, not between this side and this side. So this is what we call the page curve of a normal body. After Don Page, who talked about this. The problem with the black hole is because the particles are coming out of the vacuum and not from the surface of something like a piece of coal, the entanglement keeps rising with every pair produced, so the curve keeps going up. So one way the information paradox can be phrased is that this entanglement curve, it should normally go up in the beginning, but it should really come down. Like for every body, you can see why it's coming down. But for the black hole, because the guys are coming out of the vacuum and not from the guys which are already there, everything else radiates by breaking off pieces which are already there, but here they come out of the vacuum. That's why we're having this problem. And okay, so this is just restating what our puzzle is. And we haven't really gotten a solution. This is just to state the puzzle in little formal language. Okay, so let me just talk for a few minutes about uh, uh, how the solution comes up in string theory. And I then will just drop the rest of the talk because we ran out of time. But we can take that up in the later sessions. So is this supposed to be roughly like a one hour talk? Is that so, is someone at all? Right? Five minutes late? Okay. Okay, I'll take a quick time. Okay. So let's talk about first ball. So what did we find? So just to repeat what we had on the previous slide, in string theory, black holes were made by taking all the different kinds of brains and making a bound state, and we can count them. And so this was the belief that at weak coupling, the whole thing was some bunch of brains, and each brain is basically Planck scale physics, so the size of the bound state was about Planck size. And that looks correct. But the idea was that when you go to strong coupling, the brains, of course, they are just stringy objects, so they'll have like Planck size structure, but the gravitational field around it, this is a dotted line showing the radius 2 gm by c square, a black hole will develop around it. Right? So the normal idea is that under gravity, everything shrinks to a point, and then it's just the vacuum, and the horizon is just an imaginary space, which gives you the domain out of which you can't go, but there's nothing here. We saw the picture why there was nothing here. But what we started doing was we started estimating the size of this bound state as we increase the coupling, and something very strange happened. As you increase the coupling, the size of the bound state actually started increasing with the coupling, and actually never became smaller than its horizon radius. So the horizon radius is called D, sorry, the size of the bound state is called D, in terms of the different numbers of brains, number of the one brains were the strings, five brains were these five dimensional sheets, NP is the number of these graviton modes, G is the string coupling, this right now we don't know what it is, but it's called a string tension parameter, V and L are like the sizes of these directions on which I wrap these brains. Again, we haven't talked about them. But you can see there are like seven parameters in here. But if you work out an estimate for the size of the bound state, it is some complicated function of these parameters. It turns out the same complicated function also gives the radius of the black hole horizon up to a factor of order unity, which these estimates, of course, don't capture, for a black hole with these charges at this value of the coupling and these compactification uh, scales. So that is something interesting because it suggests to you that if these estimates are to be uh, taken seriously, in string theory, somehow a black hole never forms. When gravity becomes stronger, instead of things shrinking together, they're sort of just stretching out. And you might ask, why is that happening? And if you trace back to where that is, as we'll see when we start making these states more explicitly, it's basically because instead of point particles, you have objects which can stretch, so like strings. So if you put a lot of energy into point particles, they can just move faster. But if you not put a lot of energy into something which can stretch, then the energy actually preferentially goes to the stretching because that's where there is more entropy, there are more ways of stretching it. And so things just ends up becoming bigger. So you, what we can now do is actually find the eigenstates of these particular bound states. And you find the actual eigenstates of the given energy. You can find all the states of the given energy for very simple cases. Then they seem to satisfy the same rule that they always become as big as the horizon. And if you never actually get a horizon to form, then the puzzle is automatically gone because the puzzle only comes because once you have a horizon, you have this place where you can create negative energy, then the whole thing becomes unstable, then you get the entangled pairs. But now it's more like a piece of coal. So the way the string theory, where this calculus suggests the string theory gets out of it is by saying that horizons never form. But you can see this is to it also changes the structure of the black hole in a radical way because normally this distance from here to here was macroscopic. It was like three kilometers for a solar mass black hole. But we are seeing the entire structure in that region changes. So one thing we have to come back and understand is how did quantum gravity, which normally operates on the Planck scale, which is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, suddenly spring out of there and start talking across lengths which are arbitrarily big. 
But the lesson here is the size of a bound state. On the face of it, this is not uh, self-contradictory. It grows with the number of charges in it. And so it's a little bit like uh, what happens in nuclear physics. If you have hard sphere packing, the more nucleons you have, the size of the bound state grows like the atomic number to the power one third. So you, you have, it depends on the theory. If you have like a Bose-Einstein condensate, the size doesn't grow at all because all the guys can sit on the same same spot. So it depends on the state on the theory to know how the size of the bound state grows with the number of charges. But what we'll see is remarkable about string theory that it grows in precisely the way which makes the size of the bound state always equal to the order of the horizon radius. Okay, so if that is true, we completely change our picture of the black hole. We also resolve the puzzle, and so now we have to go and learn about how exactly this can happen. Yeah. Yeah, there is a cosmic sensor theorem as well. So uh, that tells you that there can't be any naked singularity. There can't be any naked singularity. Okay. Without. Uh, yeah. Uh, if it involves some, if it involves some kind of uh, satellite uh, collapse, then it says that there, uh, the horizon will never form. So. Okay, let me see if I understand the question. So certainly when you do this, you find the singularity is also gone. Okay, this becomes like a normal piece of coal, there's no singularity here. Okay, so there's no singularity, there's no horizon. So the singularity being gone, sort of everybody was probably okay with that, you know, everything got fuzzed out to Planck scale, everybody thought that string theory smooth everything out at the Planck scale, so it won't be exactly a singularity. That may not be so surprising even in string theory. But the fact the horizon is gone is a much bigger thing. Once the horizon is gone, the singularity is not there because the whole thing, there's nothing special about a central point. Okay, we'll see explicit wave functions for this guy. So you can see the wave function and see what it is for very simple cases. But uh, yeah, but there's no singularity anyway. Okay. okay, so let's recall a little bit more about what the structure is. So uh, let me not go through this now. I'll pick up the details of this when we start doing the uh, detailed story of, uh, of actually constructing the fuzz balls. Let me actually jump to, the, to, to these slides which show you the picture of how this magic happens. So how do we bypass all the standard no hair theorems? And how come the standard picture of the black hole completely changed? Uh, everybody was thinking that you'll always have to have a horizon. And now we find that you never get a horizon. So what is the structure of these guys? So schematically, it looks like this. So this was a picture of the black hole. The central mass was here. This was this dotted region. And we just drew all this. But let's just draw one space dimension for simplicity. I'll just draw this as the space dimension out of all three. The mass is still here. This thing is here and the horizon radius I've just plotted here, 2 gm by c square. And if I'm in here, I get net negative energy. So all that is just copied from before. But now suppose there was an extra dimension, like a string theory has six extra dimensions, so now I have this extra dimension, so instead of having just a line, I have like more like a drinking straw, my space time looks like this. Still a cartoon, because there are six of these guys and three of space dimensions, but one and one is enough for now. So of course, extra dimensions are an old story, but they seem to have no significance for the black hole because this would be something small like a few Planck lengths. This is like three kilometers. So how does it matter if you have a straw running like this? You still have the mass sitting here, your negative energy here, and the horizon here is what people thought. So of course, extra dimensions were known, but they had nothing to do with anything. But turns out there's a completely different structure possible once you have a compact dimension. You take this drinking straw and you cut out this part which was inside the horizon from here to here, and you throw it away. And now you want to know what to do with the open ends of the straw and just close them smoothly like the end of a cigar like this. So if you have an ant crawling like this, it will just come here and go back. It's a new topology. Okay, there are some extra details which I won't worry about right now. Now this was the picture in one dimension. If you go back to three dimensions, what you would be doing is, if I want to make a fuzz ball in the center of this room, I take a ball here and I cut it out and throw it out. It's not part of my space time. <coughs> I have a compact dimension at every point in space. As I come closer to the surface of the ball, I have to wonder, will I fall into some empty hole? I've thrown that place away. But no, I come here and I just close it off. Okay. So when I close it off, as I was saying on the previous slide, you can apply a twist which can be positive or negative. You can twist it clockwise or anti-clockwise. It's some subtlety of string theory that these are called KK monopoles or anti-monopoles. But this region is not part of space-time. And so now you don't even have the region which had the negative energy particles. This structure is what we call the first ball. It's a very cartoon version, but what you find is if you take any bunch of strings at weak coupling, and then you gradually increase the coupling, you can write the state of that at all values of the coupling. I'll be showing those formula explicitly. You go to strong coupling, and you ask what metric does it produce. And you find that it had, naively it was producing this metric. People write in this metric for it. But if you actually go back and see what metric it produces, it actually produces this metric. Okay, so it's a very simple, yeah. 
this is a cartoon, but in the yes. real picture, are things still connected, but just not simply connected, or are they actually not connected? No, they are all connected. Huh? They are connected. So yeah, it's, it's just yeah, just the one D that looks non-connected. But even the three guy is connected, right? Even the three dimension is all connected. Yeah, it's only the one day which is special just seems to delink it. It's all connected. Yeah. So we'll see the wave function explicitly as, as metrics. So you actually can see that in the simplest case, this structure is what comes out. And if this is Planck length, you can see you have like a Planck scale structure at every angle of the horizon. There's a Planck length choice of something being plus or minus. And if you look at all the different possibilities of that, that roughly reproduces the entropy of the Planck. So you can see all the states are there. So look like this. This kind of an object which you actually get, we call it the first ball. Nothing can fall in because there's no place to fall in. You don't get the pair creation. It's like a piece of coal. Radiate from, it radiates from the surface like a normal body and resolve the information possible. So I, mean, I guess you could expand on this, but uh, what is the difference between this picture of a star and a black hole? So how do I distinguish a star and a black hole? In the this is just like a star. So ultimately the lesson is that there is no difference between a star and a black hole. The actual black hole is just like what you can call a stringy star, just made out of strings and brains, just like a star is made out of various stuff. It's made of atoms and neutron stars, made of neutrons and so on. Everything is made of something or the other. If you just make something out of stringy objects, conceptually, it's just like a normal bunch of stuff. It has no horizon, radiates from a surface, and everything is normal static. So the effective picture of this traditional black hole yeah. does not emerge. So the standard picture of the black hole interior, we haven't found any way to get that to emerge. Uh, in what sense that picture actually helps you for something, that we'll talk about. But uh, it's very important that the picture is actually incorrect. That you actually don't get, so I'll talk about that a little bit in later lectures, but it's very important that if you can, if this picture emerges in any approximation, you get into the Hawking problem again. Because if this picture emerges in an approximation, in that approximation you get the entangled pairs. And it's, I'm glad you asked that because that's sort of the thing which I'm going to skip on the slides after this. There was a lot of debate about this in the earlier years when this came out because people said this looks too radical. Do you really want to change the whole structure of the horizon completely based on this, some examples of simple black holes where you can compute this? And then the question would be, okay, so if the other states of the black hole really have smooth horizons, then how are you going to get out of the puzzle? And they were hoping that, you know, in some delicate way, they could hide all the correlations and get away with it. But I'm going to talk about something called a small correction theorem, which proves that you actually can't get away with it. So you need an order unity correction to the Hawking process. Otherwise, you can't get rid of the problem. But your picture must be able to explain the pictures of black holes that we've seen. Because that's completely fine because we don't see any. So this picture normally goes up to horizon plus a few Planck lengths. All the mess is here. There's no way you can observe that because all the things you're observing about black holes are from roughly the region 6M, the last stable orbit, right? And the only part you use for gravitational waves or something is using the fact that anything that comes inside 6M just gets absorbed. So any highly absorbing surface you put there has the same effect. But anything with a large number of degrees of freedom by standard statmec reasons is always highly absorbing. Right? It's just ds by de. So given energy can create more states in there than outside, it will absorb. So the absorb absorptibility of this is pretty so infinite. The it's all the same. It's, yeah, yeah. they are also way far out. I mean, nothing actually gets to within a few Planck lengths of this. There's no way to see that. Yeah. So you're saying that that's ultimately because of sort of physics that's coming from outside the horizon of the black hole. Yeah, all observations we have are from okay. outside the horizon. Sorry, sorry. And that doesn't change. Uh, yeah, that doesn't change what's happening inside. The point is, we need to get rid of the inside. So the way this physics really happens is the moment a horizon tries to form, we later see that some new effects get triggered in string theory, which don't want a closed trapped surface to form. So when a closed trapped surface is not there, nothing much happens. But we have to understand why something triggers at that scale. So because I'm out of time, let me just directly jump to what I had put in as my conclusion slide and skip everything else. Uh, okay, so what's the lesson? Of the first? Maybe I can just take a couple of minutes to say this and then I'll stop. Okay, so as we said, the classical picture was this and the new picture looks completely different. So how did the picture change so much in quantum gravity? And I think the real way that people were getting uh, maybe a little puzzled about this in the beginning was that Planck length is very small. So they thought that things should only change at the Planck scale. But the point is, if you make a big black hole, you need to put together a large number of quanta n, right? So it is still true just from dimensional grounds. That if you scatter two gravitons or two strings at high energies, 
They only knew physics can come at the Planck scale. There's no other scale in the problem. But to make a big black hole, you need to put a large number of quanta n. And now you can ask, is the relevant length scale of quantum gravity Planck length or some power of n times the Planck length? Dimensional analysis can't distinguish these two. And as you were saying, that depends on the actual theory. Because if you have nuclear physics, you're going to hard sphere packing. The size of the object goes like atomic number to the one third times, you know, times Fermi length and so on. And so what we are finding in string theory that yes, this does actually grow with n. And I had shown you the power before, you know, some power to the one third and so on. So it grows in such a way that the radius of the object is always of order the, the horizon scale. So that's the real lesson that quantum gravity really, when you consider it for a large number of particles, what is the actual effective length scale of quantum gravity? It actually blots out the entire horizon. And uh, just to say the kind of things we are working on these days is that if you look at cosmology, you know that it has lots of its own puzzles. The funny small cosmological constant is very funny that you have to induce some magical scalar field to get inflation, but where does it come from? Then we have some funny difficulty called the Hubble tension, which some of you might have heard about. Hubble constant values are not matching between early and late times. But interestingly, if you think about the cosmological horizon, it's very similar to the time reverse of the black hole horizon. If you draw a space-like slice through a flat universe at any given time, then the cosmological horizon is the place where the light cones start pointing purely outwards. So in the black hole, the light cones at the horizon point purely inwards. This is the cosmological horizon where they point purely outwards. And even the scales are all the same. The amount of energy which is, fits into this disk to turn the light cones in, if you take the cosmological horizon, the Hubble radius inverse, H inverse, if you use the Hubble law, total amount of the matter inside a cosmological horizon, 3000 megaparsecs today, that cosmological horizon, is the same as the amount of matter which would be required to make a black hole with that radius. That just follows from, from just playing around with this number. So it's really the same problem. If you just look at a cosmological horizon, it's just a time reverse of a dust ball which is trying to make a black hole. If you just time reverse it, it's just trying to make the cosmology. So whatever fun, if we learn new things at the black hole horizon scale, which completely change our picture of what the black hole is doing, then there might be funny things which are also happening at the cosmological horizon. And we are finding some effects which are actually impacting all these three problems. Okay? So I'll just stop there. Uh, it's, we have some papers in which we have been discussing that recently. So even though I think the black hole puzzle would be completely resolved by what I'm saying about fuzzballs, about this cosmology, we are still just speculating and having fun. It's not like we have anything concretely proved in that direction. Let me stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Yeah, so I think with the black hole, it's very hard for the same reasons we were just discussing because the effects are up to a few Planck lines outside the horizon. But I think that's why the cosmology is more interesting. In cosmology, you can roughly say that we are inside the black hole, right? Because we are here and the horizon is here, right? So if we can actually make predictions of that fact of how this thing fits in with cosmology, that there are so many observations. And in fact, a lot of models of fuzzballs we are using to understand their dynamics I'm actually switching to cosmology, looking at how it matches the observation, then either keeping or throwing away the hypothesis. So, because just the time reverse is the same problem. So, it's certainly a lot of the way we think about dynamics of first ball is being guided with what we actually know about cosmology. So, lots of observations there. Uh, it's not exactly the same problem, but they are very closely connected. So, certainly it's been very useful to us in making a good model of first balls. So, yeah. any specific, you know, maybe thought about any specific observables? Okay, so one thing we found here was that you get some natural explanation for the Hubble tension. So what we are finding is that the effect of first ball is such that whenever the power law expansion changes from one power law to another, when it goes from t to the half to t to the two thirds, an extra energy is induced at that transition of the right order to explain the Hubble tension. So these are just, because we don't have exact numbers, they have to remain speculation. Even the Hubble tension may or may not be there once they get more accurate data. But the fact that you automatically get some energy suggested at that scale by fuzzball dynamics, we find that interesting. So in that sense, you can connect to observations. Okay, so I can say. Yes. Uh, so uh, maybe you already said this in, in this picture, but can you say a little bit about what happens to the light cone structure as you approach the horizon? Because the usual understanding is that uh, as you come close to the horizon, then the it becomes light-like when you're at the horizon. You mean the original picture we had, like this kind of picture? Uh, yeah, so uh, in the first picture, what happens when you uh, proceed past 
Yeah. So let me give you a couple. You again get a space like. Yes. There's an inversion between space and. Between no, there is no inversion. It's gone. It's gone. That's gone. Yeah, so you're gone. What, what is the uh, what is the understanding? Yeah. So the understanding is that what happens inside a first ball. So this is the main issue which I was trying to show with these cartoons. The reason people hadn't found these solutions before in GR, even though they've made so many solutions, is that the compact dimensions and the non-compact ones, normally we think of them as a product manifold. Product means that if this is a circle, it remains a circle all through, right? So people always making more of solutions of, of uh, general relativity, always kept them as a product manifold. But the point is, the first balls are exactly the place where they are not product manifold. So what's going to happen is that the compact dimensions fiber non-trivially over the non-compact dimensions, and that's and where the solution. Is a well of Which one? Where exactly. Is a that's right. Exactly. And so that's exactly why I was trying to say the simple example is the KK monopole here and anti KK monopole here. Mm -hmm. And so when you take the two charge black hole, just to be a little technical, which Ashok Sen found before the three charge black hole Strominger Waffa, for that black hole, all the states we can exactly make. If you look at those states, you can study them at all values of the coupling. As you go to strong coupling, what you find is that you exactly get a Kaluza Klein monopole and anti monopole structure. Okay, so we can see they're all explicitly there. And I'll be showing you those metrics in the later lectures. So you know exactly that the, what is happening is that the, the, it's not trivially fibered. And that's why there are so many states, because there are many ways to non trivially fiber the compact dimensions over the non compact ones. Okay? And that's why they had all been missed. And then there was an interesting paper of Gibbons and Warner, who showed how once you uh, take this non factorization between the compact and non compact dimensions, then uh, all the no-head theorems don't work. All, all the, the no-head theorems, no -head they fail. Okay. So uh, if, I don't know if people here are familiar with this thing that Ed Witten found in 1982 called the bubble of nothing. Mm -hmm. Are people familiar with that? So if you have an extra compact circle like this, uh, and you have a theory with no fermions, which is not a real world, but a theory with no fermions, then there's an instability where the universe just develops a hole, and then the hole just expands. And so if you ask, like, why is the hole expanding? I mean, where's the energy coming from for the expansion? And you find that all the normal ideas that gravity you know, should lead to things shrinking, they don't work when you actually break the uh, structure. It's not a product structure anymore. So in that thing also, it's not a product structure. It's more like this kind of a structure. Gravity, instead of attracting, is actually exploding you out. So uh, if you have a structure like this, and you don't put the closed and monopoles, but you just close them like this without the monopoles, then uh, this thing actually tries to expand. This whole tries to, you know, the structure of the whole, this gap actually just becomes bigger and bigger. And like goes to the, start expanding the speed of light. So all the normal intuition of gravity start breaking down when the manifold, not a product manifold. But on the other hand, that's exactly what you get, which you can actually prove rigorously in string theory for at least the two charged black holes. And for some examples of the three charged black holes, you can see that's the structure you're getting. So that's where the magic is, if you like. Okay, so there are many interesting things about that, which also are part of something slides which I actually skipped here. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing about black holes, as to how in one way they are a little bit different from stars, mm -hmm. is that in principle, yes, you would go like, as I said, an ant crawls over here and then it crawls right back. Okay? But if you throw in something whose energy is, let's say, even equal to the radius of the black hole, sort of the longest thing you can think of, suppose you send something there, because the entropy of the black hole is so high and increases so quickly with the mass, the, that energy which you use to probe the object actually ends up jumping the black hole from this state to a higher energy state. So the energy gap is so small because the entropy being so large that if you try to probe it with some energy, it actually jumps to the next state rather than probe that particular microstate. So that's an essential feature of how black hole dynamics differs from the dynamics of other objects. As far as the fact that they are states and all is concerned is all standard. So but if the moment you try to... Well, this sense. In, the, in this sense, so if you want to probe a black hole, you have to use wavelengths which are much longer than even the radius of the black hole. And then you would see the for difference. A star. For a star, yeah, because the energy gap is, is small, right? But for the black hole, it is large. But the energy gap is so small for the black hole that if you try to probe it, it just jumps to the next state. There's nothing wrong with that. You can probe an atom and have it jump to the next state. It just makes it, when somebody says, can I go in and walk out? The first reason, you, if you try to walk out, you will actually jump to the next state. So you're not probing that state. Okay, it's just something technical I wanted to mention. Yeah. So the 
Yes, yes, yes. Obviously, obviously, because the entropy is e to the s back, the mass is m, so the level spacing is just that upon e to the s back, and because the Bekelstein entropy is so huge, it just leads to funny, funny issues. So actually, everything has to do with the large entropy of the black hole, and so we'll see that that's what leads to all the funny issues there. Okay, I guess I stop here. We are out of time, but I'll see you in the next lecture. But if anybody wants to hang around and chat, then we can still chat. Yeah.